Wow, what a class. You guys just quiet down so nicely. Thank you. This is great. You make my job easy. Thanks go to several organizations that make an event like this possible. First of all, I want to thank the Ford Presidential Foundation from across the street. Ah, Joe Calvaruzzo, please stand up, take a hand. And Elaine Didier at the Ford Presidential Museum. Where is Elaine? Elaine, take a hand. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I just have to say, I've said this many times before, but we have, I think, the best partnership in the United States between a presidential foundation, a presidential museum, and a university-based think tank of presidential studies. And so we're very proud of that partnership we can bring programs like this to you. Uh, I also want to bring greetings from Ralph. Uh, he could not make it this evening, but he is uh, going to be very eager to watch the, the, you know, the, the video of this, so you all have to behave, because he's going to be watching the uh, audience in that. And I want to say, uh, Ralph and I were talking about this, this talk. Uh, actually, since uh, last winter, when he first heard a, an iteration of the talk that you're going to hear, but you're going to hear something very different tonight as well. And when I think of the title that Herb Meyer chose for this evening's talk, what in the world is going on? It made me think back on a famous novel. Uh, I'm reminded of A Tale of Two Cities, that novel by Charles Dickens that came out in 1859. It's this novel about all of the tensions in the French Revolution building up. It's an era of intense change. And it has all of the possibilities and the opportunities and the challenges that a people face. And the, the novel starts with a striking passage that I want to use to set the stage here this evening. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. And that's what our speaker is grappling with and is going to bring to us tonight, the sense of all of these tensions. We have everything before us. Now, to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, I'd like to uh, have Tom Haas come up in just a moment. I think everybody in this room knows who Tom is. He's been with us since 2006. He's Grand Valley's fourth president. Very proud of the job he has done here at Grand Valley. He's, his leadership has made it possible for organizations like the Hellenstein Center to thrive and for the partnerships in this town to thrive. Now, many of you may not know this, but Tom is a professor of chemistry. He has an international reputation in hazmat, I think, uh, hazardous materials. And here's the special thing about Tom. He actually stays in the classroom and, and teaches. And I think you need that in a college president. So I really applaud Tom for his presence in the classroom and keeping students uh, involved in, in his life. And, and it's, it, they, they love him for it. He's also, the other thing in this time when we speak so much of war, I also honor Tom because he's a retired captain with 23 years of experience in the Coast Guard. So we appreciate that too, Tom. Tom, come on up. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Gleaves. I appreciate that very much. And <clears throat> today is a special evening to have a speaker like Herb Myers join us. And it's great to uh, look around uh, this uh, this audience uh, full of people that uh, Marcia and I have gotten to know over these past uh, now eight and a half years. I've said that we've had a good start of the semester. Now I looked at the calendar and we're halfway through this semester, so I can't say that anymore. The midterms are this week, and right around the corner is uh, December commencement. And then uh, we pick it up again for the uh, winter, winter term as well. So the rhythms of the academic year, I think, keeps us all uh, engaged and enthused because we are able to uh, uh, engage with our students. And I know Herb uh, had a chance to do that uh, today, engaging with, with uh, some of our students and last night as well. So um, in fact, when, when we were together in Florida, he said, I'd love to come up to Grand Rapids. I know I was there a few years ago, but I'd love to engage with some students. And I think we were able to kind of do two or three of those things because we also want to engage with our community that want to hear what you have to say. Um, so I'm, I'm just thrilled to uh, welcome you here on behalf of uh, now 
over 25,000 students and all the faculty and staff that served them. So that's a milestone, a record number for us this year. And that on top of uh, over 4,200 new freshmen too. So yeah, we, we've had uh, some uh, good numbers, good stability. And I think we have very, very good momentum as we leave into the next decade of service here for Grand Valley State University. The other thing, I'll just let you know, this is kind of a neat little trivia point, but uh, we graduated our first uh, alums in 1967. So we are now, what, 14, right? So 50 years ago, we didn't have any alums. Come April, we'll have 100,000. Isn't that remarkable, the vision? of folks like Bill Seidman and others who said, we need a Grand Valley State University. And boy, that really is. So a little bit of, uh, of background, why I, I'm thrilled to get up every morning, come into the office or go into the community across the state, nation, and at times the world, and um, really wear the uh, Grand Valley flag so proudly because I'm representing all you and representing those alums and our great community here. So let me uh, start off and saying again, thanks, uh, Gleaves, for bringing me up here so I can do this introduction. And uh, really do, uh, again, thank the uh, uh, Gerald R. Ford uh, Presidential Foundation uh, in the support uh, that we've had. And I also want to uh, recognize that partnership, uh, Joe and Elaine, uh, because it is really special. And I do appreciate that very much. Well, on these days, it's always great to welcome someone from Washington. <laughs> What are you smiling? He's from Washington State. <laughs> okay, and, and Marsh and I had a chance to go into the uh, northwest corner twice. We went to Vancouver, and we also did some camping up in, uh, in the Cascades as well. So we were in, the, in your neighborhood, as, as you know, this uh, uh, past uh, summertime with, with our family. But it is uh, nice to welcome someone here from the other Washington, so to speak. Uh, well, he does come from an island uh, j just north of Seattle, a beautiful part of, uh, of the American landscape. But I tell you this, that he has been coming and uh, here to Grand Rapids and uh, down in Florida when we've had him there with our uh, events there to uh, help uh, look at the future. And I think that uh, if I could characterize Herb, it's that he is a futurist. He's very well founded with his facts coming and using those in his stories that he will share with us as well. So we're honored to welcome you back here, sir. Um, an interesting little uh, uh, side note that um, we discovered uh, when we first met is we're neighbors, you know? Now I'm, I'm looking at my good friend, uh, Mrs. Panopoulos from Staten Island, right? Well, he's from Brooklyn, okay? It's close enough. He went to PS, I'm gonna use my New York accent because I'm from New York too. Now he's from uh, PS 20, 206. I'm from PS22. You went to PS30. Uh, okay. Well, close enough. Okay. What, what can I tell you? Okay. But, uh, but truth be told, it, it really is. Uh, we we uh, discovered that, that connection of uh, being uh, uh, from New York, and, and the connections are, are really deep as we see those uh, paths uh, being crossed. But we, we also have something in, uh, else in common and uh, something that I think is the music to ears of uh, college presidents. And he will, without a doubt, tell you that he is a lifelong learner. And that's something that we here at Grand Valley State University embrace. And he, uh, he went to Brooklyn College, where he earned his bachelor's degree in political science. And then for his master's degree, he studied abroad in Paris at the Institute for International Politics. And we rolled out, and you didn't know this, sir, but uh, we rolled out uh, a vision for the university over these next years of being relevant for Michigan, but also having a global impact. And I think you have embraced that, too, with, with your background. Uh, after graduation, he worked hard and trained in intelligence and landed some uh, great uh, jobs in the Reagan administration. And he became a special assistant to the CIA director, uh, William Casey. And uh, uh, this is not hyperbole, but he is widely cr credited for being the first U.S. government official to forecast the Soviet Union's collapse, a forecast for which he was later awarded the U.S. National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medal, which is the intelligence community's highest honor. So I, I congratulate you on that, sir.
One of the things that uh, you'll know tonight that uh, we, we do smile when we say Washington, but inside the Beltway, he is a well-respected uh, uh, individual. And he learned, I'm sure, lots about leadership from observing as we have with the uh, Hallenstein uh, Center for Presidential Studies. We, we want to observe those presence and others in, in leadership roles. Uh, he, he did that firsthand uh, with the White House. He observed leadership, he interacted with it, and he started writing it, writing about it and publishing his insights as well. He is without a doubt a passionate leader, and that's the one, one of the reasons why we bring him back uh, to Grand Valley State University. So as I mentioned from the outset, he has had a chance to interact with some of our honor students and interact with uh, emergent leaders with the uh, Hallenstein Center's uh, Cook Leadership uh, Academy and sharing some of that wisdom uh, with, with our students. So now it's our turn to uh, hear what his insights uh, are. Uh, and I love the title, What in the World is Going On? So ladies and gentlemen, please join me uh, in welcoming Herb Meyer to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. He's from Staten Island, I'm from Brooklyn. If the two of us were alone, we'd talk normal. <laughs> By the way, my mother was a school teacher in New York. You probably had her in one of your classes. <laughs> but we won't do that this year. <laughs> By the way, if you're wondering why, for those of you who are students here, why I went from Brooklyn College to the University of Paris, it's very simple. I thought French girls would like me better than American girls. <laughs> like me. They did. They had a nicer way of telling me to get lost. So to me, that was a big improvement. Anyway, thank you for inviting me. I'm so happy to be back here in Grand Rapids with you. And my special thanks to Gleave and Doug, who got me in front of students today. I really appreciate that, and I was delighted to do it today and last night. So thank you. Let's turn to business. We've all had the experience of being on an airplane when it hits turbulence, and it's frightening. Plane lurches, loses altitude, one of the overhead bins pops open, and you're just sitting there tightening your seatbelt, bouncing along, wondering if maybe you should break the rules, power up your cell phone, make one last call home. <laughs> and the pilot comes on the intercom, he says, sorry about this, we'll be out of it in five or six minutes, it's clear up ahead. Well, how does he know that? The answer, of course, is that he's got radar in the cockpit. Radar is the instrument that tells him what's out in front of him. Not what he can see looking out the windshield, what's further out ahead but not yet visible. What a lot of people don't realize, even in Washington, D.C., is that the CIA was built to be the president's radar, the instrument that would tell him what the future is going to be and to tell him that future soon enough and clearly enough so he could prepare for the future. If he didn't like the future, he could change the future before it happens. That's the whole point. Did we use spies and covert action? Of course we did. And you do that so you can get the information to the president so he can deal with it. I was lucky enough to be part of President Reagan's radar. And this evening, I'd like to do for you what we did for President Reagan. I want to paint a picture of the world that lies in front of us, not the turmoil we're going through right now. That's frightening, it's depressing, it's scary. The economy is weaker than we want. Levels of spending are out of control. ISIS is marching all over the Mideast. The evil of virus seems to be uncontrolled at the moment. It's easy to be frightened by the turbulence we're going through. And if we start in on that, we'll never get out of here. What I'd like to do is be your radar system. I'd like to show you what's on the other side of that turbulence we're going through now. It's a very different world, and I think a much more interesting world. One point before we begin, I've been dealing with this for a long time. In the last few years, a trend has developed in our country that's unhealthy. We argue before we understand. That is not a smart thing to do, sets a terrible example for young people. When there are complicated and contentious issues, honorable people will disagree about how to deal with them. That's fine. That's how we figure out our way forward. Intelligent people should be able to reach a common understanding of what the problem is before we start yelling and screaming about the solution. Doesn't happen. Look at any of the political campaigns. Watch any of the talk shows. 
Even when I'm on one of the panels, it's unbearable. Everyone's shouting past everyone. No one's listening. The one thing you never hear from a talking head on CNN or Fox or MSNBC is, gee, that's an interesting point you just made. I haven't thought about that. I'm going to change my mind. I mean, no one ever changes their mind about anything. Let's not do that. I've left my politics at home. If you want to know what I would do about all this, buy me a beer some evening. I will be happy to tell you in great detail how to solve all the world's problems. Let's leave the partisan politics out of this. If we can reach an understanding of what the world's going to look like, what it's going to mean to you, especially those of you here tonight who are students, we'll have accomplished a great deal. So let's light up the radar screen and see what's out there. When you look at the world, the first thing you see is that the world is becoming modern. And this is what the war is really all about. It's about modernity. And the best way to explain modernity is to go back into history. Sometimes you have to go back to see where you were, to see where you are now, and to see where you're going. So just for a moment, let's look behind us. We'll go back to Europe at the end of the 17th century. 1690, 1695, sometime around there. Life was terrible. Lifespan was very short, mid-40s in most places. Most people were half starved most of the time. When they prayed, they prayed that when the next famine came, at least some of their children might survive. That's what you prayed for. That's how bad it was. People were uneducated, illiterate. Women weren't allowed to be educated. Travel was rare. Most people spent their entire lives within 20 miles of where they'd been born. You had no say in how you were governed. You're a peasant, you're a serf, so shut up, did what you were told. And nothing changed. Tomorrow was the same as yesterday. The way you plowed the field, that's how your grandfather did it. That's how your grandson would do it. If you were the woman of the house, the way you prepared meals, washed clothes, that's how your grandmother did it, that's how your granddaughter would do it. Everything was static. The modern world's very different. Lifespan is nearly 80. Incomes vary widely, but there's no starvation. For the first time in history, we have a society, the modern world, no one's starving. Do you realize what an extraordinary human achievement that is? It's happened within our lifetimes. No one is starving in the modern world. It is so extraordinary that today we are told accurately the biggest health problem faced by poor people in the modern world is obesity. Isn't that extraordinary? Women are educated, they're literate, they own businesses, they're senior executives, they run for political office. We travel all the time. We have a huge say in how we're governed. We don't always like the outcome of elections, but we have a big say in it, and nothing stays the same. The technical word for the kind of change we live with is industrial productivity. From the moment someone comes along and says, you know, there's a better way to do that, a person starts a business, they hire people, standards of living go up, there's a whole industry doing it. Next thing you know, someone has a second idea, there's a second industry, a third, a fourth. Five, 10, 30 years later, someone comes along with an even better way to do it. Completely changes the first industry. Then it happens to the second and the third. It's like an escalator that never actually stops. Like with any piece of machinery, from time to time it breaks down. And if it breaks down and you don't have a good firm grip on the guardrail, you get hurt. And then it picks up again and it goes. That's us. That's the modern world. That's who we are. That's how we live. Our transition to the modern world wasn't smooth and seamless. The 18th and 19th centuries were violent. Our own country broke apart into a civil war. Before that war ended, we killed more than 700,000 of each other, which is about double what they've killed in Syria and Iraq combined. Oh, and a president was assassinated. Look what we had to go through. Look what we came through. The 20th century was ghastly. World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Bosnia, fascism, communism. Look what it took to get us here. When you look at the Mideast, when you look at all the turmoil in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Egypt, Libya, all the rest, what you're looking at is the entire Islamic world beginning to make the journey we began more than 300 years ago. And what we keep saying to these people is, can't you guys do this by next Thursday? <laughs> no, look at the mistakes we made. Look how long it took us. Our own country broke apart into a civil war. We're living through one of the greatest moments in world history. The Islamic world is on the road to modernity. 
wow. And by the way, there are people in this audience tonight, like Doug, wherever he is, who are helping do that. They're helping take them down that road. This is an extraordinary moment in history. And remember, when you study history, it's the story of competing operating systems. Our operating system is Western civilization. This is who we are. Western civilization started in the ancient world, took off in Europe, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, when Judaism and Christianity reconciled with modernity. The rabbis, the priests, the scholars eh, figured it out, paved the way forward. That triggered the scientific revolution itself. It ignited the greatest explosion of art, literature, and music we've ever known. Shakespeare, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Bach. When you stand back from it, here's what Western civilization is. The individual is at the center of it. Church and state are separate. It's the rule of law. The idea of property rights, economic liberty, individual rights, human rights, women's rights. In Western civilization, we unleash the entrepreneurial talents of our people. We encourage intellectual curiosity. It's an endless struggle for equality among the races and the sexes. Islam's a marvelous religion, and most Muslim people are marvelous people. It's not a problem, but it's a different operating system. In Islam, church and state are often combined. In many cases, it's a political structure as well as a faith, and the individual is subservient to that church-state combination. When that happens, you do not have the option to opt out. Islam does not unleash the entrepreneurial talents of its people, and it discourages intellectual curiosity. That's why there hasn't been a scientific breakthrough from the Islamic world in a 1,000 years. And this is a tragedy. The Muslims are geniuses. They invented algebra. They virtually invented science. There's no other example of the history of this happening. But if you spend a 1,000 years crushing intellectual curiosity and slaughtering your geniuses, you don't get new science. You don't get new technology. There's one other feature of that operating system that's relevant. All too often, not always, but all too often, women are treated as though they were property rather than people. Very simply put, that operating system has been incompatible with the modern world, and that's the glitch. What we're looking at now is a billion and a half people beginning to write the code for version 2.0, beginning to figure out how to reconcile the principles of their faith, which are just marvelous, with modernity, the way we started to do centuries ago. And there's no one here who thinks we've got this nailed down, that we've done it right. Don't expect them to be any better than we are. It's going to take time. But don't be discouraged. We're living through one of the great moments in history. And by the way, it's in the nature of the news that you only hear about things that go wrong. Airplane lands on time isn't a Fox News alert. <laughs> there's a lot going right. I'll give you an example. In Afghanistan, just about three days ago, they completed a presidential election. This is one of the most extraordinary events of our lifetimes. They held the first round of voting. The candidates held a series of presidential debates. Uh, young people were out campaigning, putting up posters, knocking on doorbells, tweeting, doing all kinds of things. They held the first round of voting. They eliminated some candidates. They held a second round. They eliminated. They were down to two candidates. They held the third round of voting politics being politics. There were accusations of voter fraud and vote counting irregularities and things. Well, about a week ago, the two candidates met and agreed to govern together. One is president and one in a new position, which is prime minister. Wow. And they were sworn into office, I think, three days ago. I think on Monday or last Friday. Wow. Barely made the news. By the way, that election in Afghanistan was better managed, the votes more accurately counted, than anything we will see for another 50 years in Chicago. <laughs> a friend of mine in Chicago says I'm an optimist. It's going to be 100 years. Wow. The Afghans just put us to shame. What an extraordinary event. Look, it's politics. It's Afghanistan. Something can go wrong tomorrow. But holy cow. Don't be discouraged. We're living through one of the greatest moments in world history. The Islamic world is on the road to modernity. And when they've done that, we will be living in a modern world. Wow.
And as the world becomes modern, now we can see the second big thing happening as that radar screen sweeps around the dial. Not only is the world becoming modern, the world's becoming rich, fast. Never in history have so many human beings emerged so swiftly from poverty. And here are the numbers. By 1980 or 1990, about 2 billion people had emerged from poverty. Since then, about another half billion have crossed the line out of poverty, a lot of them in China and India. In the last six years, about 20 million Brazilians have emerged from poverty. Today on the continent of Africa, the number of people with disposable income is over 300 million. It's bigger than the US population. When you put all the numbers together, here's what you've got. Each year, between 50 million and 100 million human beings are crossing the line out of poverty. The low credible estimate is 50 million a year. The high credible estimate is 100 million a year. With numbers that big, you can't be too precise. I think it's been closer to the high end, but let's be conservative with the global recession and all that. Let's just bring the numbers down. So every year, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70 million human beings are crossing the line out of poverty. Now, when we say somebody's crossed the line out of poverty, we don't mean they have a big house with a swimming pool in the backyard and two big cars in the driveway. To be out of poverty means there's enough food to eat. They're living decently, not as nicely as you or I live, but they're living decently. The children have been inoculated against the basic childhood illnesses, as our children have, as you young people have been. They're up in the morning, they're getting breakfast, they're off to school. At least one of the parents has some kind of work that gives him some disposable income. Not as much as you've got or I've got, but some disposable income. That's what it means to be out of poverty. And today, more people are crossing that line more rapidly than at any time in human history. If this trend continues, at the moment it's accelerating. If it simply continues at the rate it's been at, what it means is this. Within your lifetimes, when the, within the lifetimes of those of you who are students today, the world will cross a line that's never been crossed before and that most people never even imagined could be crossed. For the first time in history, the overwhelming majority of human beings will not be poor. Isn't that stunning? And those of you who are students here tonight, you will live to see it. For the rest of us, we might make it. If we don't, our children will, our grandchildren will see it. Isn't that extraordinary? Why is it happening? We figured it out. There are some things you need a genius to figure out. Jonas Salk and the polio vaccine. One day, another genius will develop a pill that prevents dementia or cures cancer. Other things, you don't need a genius, a little common sense and experience. A good example is physical fitness. If you want to be physically fit, eat sensibly, get a lot of exercise. Everybody knows that. It's not complicated. Well, when everybody knows something, more people do it. That's why you see people jogging all hours of the day and night. People like us join health clubs. At least we talk about eating sensibly. <laughs> I've never actually done it, but as an intellectual concept, you know, get it. Well, on a much larger scale, you want to bring your population out of poverty, it's the free market. Property rights, the rule of law, stable financial system, reasonable regulation and taxation. Put that in place, kaboom, your population comes out of poverty. It's not that complicated. Every peasant in every field in the world understands what I just said. They can't put those words on it. What they know is that their government will protect them rather than threaten them, give them a framework, property rights, rule of law, stable financial system. Do things a government's supposed to do, protect them from foreign attack, uh, build roads, run the schools, deliver the mail collect the garbage, and on and on and on. And then just get out of the way. People come along, they start businesses, they hire other people, standards of living go up. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows it, more people do it. Today, all over the world, governments are putting in place these free market mechanisms. By the way, today, seven of the world's 10 fastest growing economies are in sub-Saharan Africa. Isn't that stunning? And the result of all this is the biggest underreported news story in the world, the emergence of a global middle class. This is extraordinary. 
and you see it all the time in the oddest ways. You go off on a business trip to some country you never heard of before, or a family vacation. You get to your hotel room, push the curtains back, take a look out down the street, and there's traffic going back and forth, and there's a shopping center over here. You look the other way, there's a movie theater, a bunch of restaurants. You go, when did that happen? And it's just the last 30 years. Why did it happen? Figured it out. I think I was telling you in Florida, I was in a hotel room one night. I'm always in hotel rooms. And the wireless system went down, so I couldn't get my email. Can't get your email, you panic. You always think the next email could be the one. You know, <laughs> you, know, you finally get your email working. What comes in is an email trying to sell me an ointment to enlarge a part of my body I had not previously been told was too small. For this, I was screaming at the young woman at the front desk. Next thing I know, I'm talking to um, technical helpline. It sounded like a college student working a part-time job in California. He figured out the router on the floor of my hotel had gone down. So he was rebooting the router. Then a couple of minutes to chat. And he said this was his last call. He was finishing his work shift. He was going to get together with some friends, have supper, maybe catch a movie. And at one point in the conversation, I said, by the way, where are you? And he said, oh, I'm in Guatemala City. I said, what are you doing in Guatemala City? He said, I'm Guatemalan. He had no accent that I could pick up. And a half hour before I talked to him, I was talking to my son in Boston. Tom said he was finishing his work shift, he was get together with some friends, have supper, maybe catch a movie, same thing. <laughs> you know, if you order something by telephone from L.L. Bean or whatever, uh, you know how often the call bounces to India or the Philippines? Do you have any idea how often they're bouncing your call somewhere else? There's a call center in Nairobi called Ken Call, Kenya Call Center. If you're sitting at a call center in Nairobi, you're in an office building, set of headphones on, computer on the table, finish your work shift, jump in the car, pick up your kid at the daycare center, swing over to the supermarket, get something for supper. There's a chain of supermarkets in Africa called Moss Mart. Walmart just bought them. There's another chain called Nakuma. They put up big box grocery stores like Costco all over the place. Uh, go home, flip on the 42-inch flat screen TV, catch up on the local news while you get supper on the table. After supper, walk the dog, run your kids over to some high school soccer practice, or go to church choir practice, or just settle down, watch a movie on TV. All over the world, in countries most people have never heard of, you now have these middle-class societies. It's the biggest underreported story in the world. It's good for several reasons. First, the human reason. It's a lot of children, not hungry. This is wonderful. Second reason is political. People like us don't go to war with people like us. We just don't. We send nasty emails. <laughs> that doesn't work. Call the lawyers. Nobody goes in shooting. You know, it's almost impossible to get people in a democracy to want war. You're busy with your job, with your kids. You want to do something on the weekend. Uh, people would rather shop than fight. And I'll give you an example of this. Today, Western Europe is in terrible financial trouble. I mean, boy, are they in financial trouble. And I'll give you an idea of how bad this is. Last year, my wife and I spent a month in Rome. We rented an apartment in Rome. It was a terrific vacation. And when you, know, you hang out, you learn stuff. 50% of young Italians, meaning under the age of 35, have never worked. That's the official statistic. Wander around Rome, it's much higher than that. They've never worked. The official statistic they put out about a week ago is 64% of young Italians, meaning under the age of 35, 64% are still living at home. And again, the real figure's got to be higher than that. When we were there, IKEA opened a store in the city of Pisa, Italy. It took them eight years to get approval. This being IKEA, we can assume they did the paperwork correctly, OK? It took them eight years. When they were about to open the store, they advertised for 200 jobs. They got 29,000 applications. When they opened a store in Sicily, they got 43,700 applications. Look, this, is, this isn't just an economic problem. This is a human catastrophe. You have an entire generation that has never worked and probably never will hold a job in their lives. How they dress so well is one of the great unsolved mysteries of the universe. <laughs> but they have never worked and probably will never work in their lives. Spain is in worse shape. Greece is a basket case. France is going down the drain. There isn't going to be a war. Not a chance. 
Germany isn't arming secretly behind the Rhine. Italy's not going to invade Ethiopia. Spain's not going to hit Portugal. The finance ministers will meet, I think, next Wednesday. They'll come up with another crazy euro loan. But there isn't going to be a war, and that's good. People like us simply don't go to war. Look, I'm the biggest hawk you're ever going to have here in Grand Rapids. Okay, I was Reagan's guy at the CIA. I have actually fondled nuclear bombs. <laughs> Very smooth, by the way. Uh, never give up your armed forces. There's always some clown out there who's going to cause trouble, whether it's an Adolf Hitler or an Osama bin Laden, maybe a Vladimir Putin. But I'll tell you, the kind of wars we've had in the past, massive movements of infantry troops, Navy fleets sailing the oceans, bombers overhead, that kind of thing is less likely in the future than in the past as the world becomes middle class. It is simply almost impossible to get middle class people to go to war, and that's good. Those of you here tonight who are students will live in a safer world than we live in now. And the final reason all this emergence of modernization and coming out of poverty and the creation of a global middle class is so good is economic. As the world emerges from poverty, as we create a global middle class, it means the total customer base for every product and service American companies can provide is now growing at a rate of 50 to 100 million new customers every year. Wow. And boy, do we need these customers. And we need them now. And the reason we need them now is because of the third and last of the very big things happening in the world. This one's not so good. It's happening in our own part of the world, and no one saw this coming. The first big thing is the world's becoming modern. Second big thing, emerging from poverty, creating a global middle class. Third big thing happening in the world is we're getting old. And here are the numbers. If you want to sustain a country's population, the birth rate has to be 2.1, 2.1 births per woman. You need two births just to replace the mother and father. Then you need point one. Some children don't live, don't grow up and have their own children. So the crucial number to sustain a country's population is 2.1. Today in Western Europe, the birth rate's 1.5. It's 30% below replacement. What that means in real numbers is 30 years from now, there will be between 70 and 80 million fewer Europeans alive than are alive today. It's the biggest, fastest population drop in recorded history. We're living through it right now. The birth rate in Germany is 1.3. Ask a German teenager, how many cousins have you got? And the kid says, what's a cousin? If you have one child, the child grows up and marries someone who's also an only child, then they have one child, which is what's happening. There's no aunt, there's no uncle, there's no cousin. In Germany, 30% of all women are childless. Among college-educated German women, 40% are childless. That's shut down. It means the number of deaths among Germans vastly exceeds the number of births. In other words, the population of living Germans is plunging. By the way, among those of you here tonight who are students, how many of you are the sons or daughters of college-educated mothers? Great. Well, if this were Germany, 40% of you wouldn't exist. Isn't that stunning? The two countries in Western Europe with the lowest birth rates are Italy and Spain. 1.2 dropping to 1.1. With a 1.2 birth rate in 20 years, you lose 30% of your entire working age population. Can you imagine taking 30% of the working age population out of Grand Rapids in the next 20 years? Economy's dead. Who's in the schools? Who's in the restaurants, the malls? Who's buying the products and services American companies are trying to sell? And this is what's happening now in Europe. It turns out also, to everyone's complete surprise, there's a powerful correlation between faith and children. People of faith tend to lead traditional lives. Grow up, get married, settle down, have a family. Well, Europe has lost its faith. Europe describes itself as a secular post-Judeo-Christian civilization. It's their phrase for it in their new constitution. It's an elegant way of saying the churches are empty except for a few old ladies and American tourists. It's true. 
If your whole population thinks, look, this is a cosmic joke, okay? It's nothing there. We're a collection of molecules. We're held together by gravity. At some point, we activate. At some point, we deactivate. If that's what you think, you're not going to fight for anything. What are you fighting for? It's a joke. You're here for the ride. Make yourself comfortable. Enjoy it. It's a lot more pleasant to sit at a cafe or go skiing than it is to stay up all night with a sick kid. So they stopped having babies. They also stopped getting married. Uh, today in Europe, only one out of seven couples gets married. Marriage is pretty much over. Last year in England, the total number of marriages was lower than the total number of marriages in England in 1895. So they don't like getting married. They don't like having babies. Turns out they don't like working either. <laughs> the average European gets an additional 450 hours per year vacation versus an American. That's 10 and a half weeks. If every American worker got an additional 10 and a half weeks paid vacation, the economy drops dead. In Scandinavia, it's, it's a bigger gap, about 17 weeks. Statistically, one out of five working age Swedes is on permanent disability insurance. Just odd, they look healthy to me. <laughs> There's a young woman in um, Stockholm she claimed to be allergic to electricity. And don't laugh, you're being culturally insensitive. Which may be a crime in Michigan by this point. Claimed to be allergic to electricity and therefore cannot be employed anywhere electric power is used. So she applied for permanent disability insurance and she got it. Look, here's the problem. In the modern world, there's a deal and it's this. The modern state is a welfare state. And I mean that non-politically. The modern state has an obligation to its citizens, to the young, to the poor, to the disadvantaged, to the sick, to the elderly. We can argue over how to do that. Democrats against Republicans, liberals and conservatives. In France, Gaulists versus socialists. In England, labor versus conservative, and on and on. But everyone accepts the point the modern state must serve its people, of course. Boy, is that expensive. But where does a modern state get money from? And the answer, of course, is from taxpayers. And the next really complicated question is, well, where do you get taxpayers from? And the answer, of course, is from children. They grow up. They become taxpayers. That's how the world works. We used to understand this. When we were agricultural societies, everyone knew you need a lot of kids, got to work the farms. Then we became industrial societies, post-industrial societies. All the geniuses, all the deep thinkers said, oh, you just don't need a lot of kids anymore. Got a machine. Whoops. No one did the math. Here's what happens. I was talking to a young woman in California. She has one sister. So her parents produced two children to take care of two parents. Take care of meaning work, generate the tax re revenue from Medicare, Social Security, every other program. And take care of your parents, literally. I mean, stay in touch, get together on holidays, things you do with parents. This young woman has a partner. Not a husband, a partner. They don't plan to have children. Her sister is married, has one child, and they don't plan to have any more. So these four people produced one child. Do you realize the tax burden on that one child to support four people? That's crushing. And that's what's happening. This is math, not politics. What you're looking at in Europe isn't an overvalued euro or a recession. It's a demographic death spiral. And the same thing's happening now in Japan. The birth rate in Japan is 1.3 and dropping, same as Germany. That means 30 years from now, there will be between 50 and 60 million fewer Japanese alive than are alive today. They're shutting it down. They've already closed 2,000 schools in Japan, K through 12. They now close schools at a rate of 300 school closings, sorry, 400 school closings now every year. They plan to keep closing 400 schools a year as far ahead as they can see. They've closed two universities and now closing a third. They've started combining prefectures, which is their states, like combining Nebraska and Kansas. That's shut down. What actually happens is this. When your birth rate drops below the 2.1 replacement level, your entire population is aging because you don't have enough young people replacing older people. Japan is aging so fast. By 2020, just six years from now, one out of every five Japanese citizens will be over the age of 70. 
and no one can figure out how to run a modern society with one out of five people over 70. With all the trouble they've had in the last year or two, the earthquake, the tsunami, that nuclear meltdown at Fukushima, you probably saw stories in the newspapers and on TV that there was no looting in Japan. Well, yeah, old people don't loot. <laughs> last year, Unicharm, which is the largest manufacturer of diapers in Japan, announced that for the first time ever, they are now selling more adult diapers than baby diapers. <laughs> you realize Japan is committing national suicide. I mean, sayonara. It's over, and they know it. Here's what it's the world's, what, third largest economy. Here's what's happening in the United States. For 30 years, the US birth rate was stuck at two just below the 2.1 replacement level. So we're going in the same direction as everyone else, not at the same rate. Three years ago, for the first time in 30 years, the US birth rate hit the 2.1 replacement level. And everyone thought, whew, boy, getting better. When demographers looked closely at the numbers, what they found was this. Three years ago, the Hispanic birth rate in the US was 3.2. The Anglo birth rate was 1.8. That's why we hit the 2.1. It was the Hispanic birth rate being over 3. With the recession, with a lot of Hispanics returning to their native countries, once again, the US birth rate has dropped below the 2.1 replacement level. We're now at 1.9. Remember I said there's a correlation between faith and children? Anybody want to guess which of our 50 states has the lowest birth rate and which has the highest? Lowest is Vermont. Secular, liberal, Vermont. If the present trend continues, the last two surviving Vermonters will be Ben and Jerry. <laughs> and the highest is Utah. By the way, Michigan is 1.8. You're sort of just below the middle. You, you are below the replacement level on birth rates. If your population increases, it's immigration, not births. So you're below the replacement level. Every statistic I'm giving you this evening is an official statistic. These are all United Nations World Health Organization numbers. There is simply no dispute among demographers about these numbers. You can argue over whether they're good or bad or what they mean, but the numbers are rock solid. You just count. What's so frustrating is if you go to high schools and colleges across the United States, everyone's being told world population is spinning out of control. It's not true. Hasn't been true for years. Everybody knows it. That's ideology infecting education. In so many schools, what they teach our children is that the worst thing that ever happened to planet Earth is humanity. We pollute. We use resources. We teach that to kids. A lot of them grow up. They think bringing a baby into the world is committing a hostile act against the planet. Birth rates plunge. Here are the global numbers. In the West, birth rates are mostly at or below the 2.1 replacement level. Canada is 1.5, right in the middle of the European average. Mexico's birth rate is plunging. It was way over three. Now it's about 2.6, 2.7. Uh, despite the problems they're having with drugs and crime, Mexico's developing a huge middle class very quickly. And as they do, the birth rate's coming down to a pretty good level. There are some Latin American countries that are just skimming above the 2.1 replacement level, which is good. Uh, Chile, Colombia, Brazil, for example. But mostly, all through the West, birth rates are below the 2.1 replacement level. There's one exception. There's only one country in the entire modern world whose birth rate is substantially above the 2.1 replacement level, and it's Israel. Birth rate's three. 30 years from now, there will be more young people in Israel than in Germany. That's a polite way of saying 30 years from now, Israel will be able to put a bigger army onto the battlefield than Germany. Isn't that stunning? I mean, can you imagine going to Hitler in 1944? Say, hey, Adolf, don't blow your brains out. I mean, stick around. It's like really interesting. One of your Wehrmacht soldiers is going to become pope. That's Benedict. Oh, be a country you never heard of called Israel with an army that could wipe out the Wehrmacht. It's actually happening. Isn't history fascinating? In the Islamic world, birth rates are much higher. They go from 2.4 to 6.8. Even those are coming down now. And in just the last year, there's been new research that's caught the demographers completely by surprise. In some of the Islamic countries, birth rates are plunging. And the two Islamic countries where they're plunging the fastest 
are Turkey and Iran. The birth rate in Iran is so low that tonight the birth rate in the capital of Tehran is actually lower than the birth rate in Manhattan, New York. For all practical purposes, Iran doesn't have another generation. When you put all the numbers together, here's what you've got. World population is continuing to increase, but it's decelerating. Over the next 30 years, world population will top out between 9 and 10, million, 10 billion and then begin to go down. Those are the actual numbers. There's simply no dispute among demographers about those numbers. There's just a disconnect between the numbers and what people are being told. Now, there's something happening inside these numbers that gets almost no attention. But in my judgment, lies at the core of our economic problem today and your future for those of you who are students. And it's this. We're living longer and having fewer children. So populations are aging. Now, they're aging in different rates at different places. In Japan, it's catastrophic. By 2020, one out of five people is over 70. Here in the United States, as the baby boomers hit their 60s now in huge waves, what's called the elderly dependency ratio, the percentage of the population that's old, will double in the next 20 years, from 18 to 19 percent now to 38, 39 percent. So if you're wandering through a shopping mall or racing through an airport terminal and you think, see, there are a lot of old geezers around. <laughs> yeah, it's not your imagination. You know, when I started flying, when the ticket agent would open the door and say, who needs a little extra time getting down the jetway? You know, four or five, maybe six people. Flying in from Seattle the other night, by the time they finished pre-boarding, <laughs> about six of us left. <laughs> We're all billion mile, you know, 1K flies. I mean, it's not your imagination. A lot of old people out there. In Europe, by 2050, 49% of the entire population will be old. Greece, 59%. The real kicker is Germany, the economic locomotive of Europe that's going to pull them out of all this. By 2040, 61% of Germans will be old. Not a country, that's a nursing home. <laughs> According to the United Nations, remember these are official figures, there's no dispute about these figures. By about 2045, for the first time in history, the number of humans over the age of 55 will be larger than the number of humans under the age of 15. It's never happened before. It doesn't mean in 2045 everything flips, like a pyramid going up on its point. What it means is every year from now on, through the rest of our lives, through the rest of your careers, there will be more and more and more older people till about 2045 there are actually more older people than younger people. And why is that so important to those of you tonight who are students here? Because old people don't spend money the way young people spend money. That's why. When we were coming out of our country's last big recession, that was 8082, the first Reagan administration. If you remember that, that was a terrible recession. Unemployment was at 11 percent. Well, people like me and a lot of you, we were starting businesses. We were starting families. Boy, do we spend money. Get to be my age. Just don't spend that much. You put it aside for retirement, health care, your next root canal. <laughs> My doctor would like me to have a colonoscopy every three weeks. <laughs> you should see his new boat. He just docked it in the harbor. It's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> this is why we can't get the economy going. This is why those of you who are students are sometimes having so much trouble getting going and getting jobs. Okay. If you look at the history of every recession ever, at the end of that recession, the economic chart looks like a jet fighter coming off the runway. Straight across and then whoosh. This is the first time in history we're not getting that whoosh at the end of the recession. And the reason is we've never been so old. And that's the dirty secret of American politics. You know, the political campaigns we had up to the 2012 presidential elections, they went on for four years. These guys never shut up. No one mentioned this once. No Republican mentioned it, no Democrat, no liberal, no conservative, no green, no libertarian. No one ever got around to the single most important economic fact of our lives. We have never been so old. And remember, they're older than we are in Europe, and in Japan, they're older than the Europeans. 
and we just don't spend a whole lot of money. We've got the stuff we need. I mean, Jill and I got a new hot water heater last year, but it's not exactly going to get the economy off the ground. And by the way, the 2016 presidential campaigns are going full blast. I'm sure, like me, you're getting solicitations for you know, money and all that every day. No one's mentioned this. And believe me, no one will. And this is crucial to those of you who are students. How can we create the jobs for you if we're getting old and we just don't spend the kind of money we used to? And that gets us back to where we started. As the world becomes modern, as we emerge from poverty and create a global middle class, the total customer base for every product and service American companies can create is growing at a rate of 50 to 100 million new customers every year. If we can connect these products and services that are being produced here with that customer base, we can pay off the national debt, we can clear off the deficits, and we can create jobs here for an entire generation of young Americans. That's how this fits together. So we want the world to come out of poverty. Here's the problem. There's always a problem. If we go about this clumsily, the water's going to be polluted. We can't drink it. The air's going to be filthy. We're going to choke to death. But the one thing you can never say to people who want to come out of poverty is, no, sorry, too late. I have a big house, two cars, you can't. That's inhuman, it's cruel, it's wrong. The trick is this, to bring the world out of poverty and to do it without trashing the planet. Isn't that an interesting problem? And the solution that's emerging is this. We do it by creating products and services that are clever, inexpensive, and green. And that's why you keep hearing these words. This is no longer an environmental issue. This is now the core driving issue of business, to bring the world out of poverty and to do without wrecking the planet. Wow. You all know IKEA, the Swedish furniture store? I bet you've never seen the IKEA house, because they don't sell it in North America. 900 square feet. Looks exactly the way you think an IKEA house would look. You can't quite put it on top of your car and drive it home, but close. <laughs> You assemble it on a slab, probably with the same stupid black wrench you use for everything else. It's clever. It's inexpensive. Materials don't rot in a hot climate. It's fantastic. There's a company in China manufacturing a very small house. It's about 80, uh, smaller than they let you build here. They say that, that they're going to um, manufacture this for $8,600. I don't want one. You don't want one. Don't bet against these guys. And the Tata Group in India is developing new kind of housing for the emerging middle class. By the way, it's the Tata Group in India that launched the Nano. That was a $2,500 car for the emerging middle class. Not a commercial success. First products often aren't commercial success. But it opened up a whole new category. Datsun just announced a $3,000 car. Honda announced a $500 motorcycle. Clever, inexpensive, green. The Japanese. Uh, trade Ministry issued a directive to all Japanese companies. They said, develop products and services for a customer base that has between $9 and $24 a day disposable income. You and I can go to Costco, Walmart, Myers, and, and you buy this gigantic box of laundry soap. It's cheap, but you need 12 bucks. If you have $14 a day disposable income, that's a lot of money. Well, what the packaging companies like Procter & Gamble are doing now is developing all new packaging. You don't see it in our part of the world. It's inexpensive. And they can package things in smaller doses so you can go back every few days and get a little bit more. In other words, we're learning how to package products and services to reach a customer base that's never been there before, wants everything we've got, but doesn't have that much disposable income. Another good example of that is e-books. E-books. Electronic books, clever, inexpensive, and green. Look, if you want to buy one of my books, great, buy the book. I'll cut down a tree to make the book for you. Then I'll burn fuel shipping it to you, or Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Well, you download the e-book onto your iPhone or your iPad. Same content, no environmental damage, fraction of the cost. Clever, inexpensive, green. That's how the world is changing. And by the way, just to give you a personal example, I've got these two e-books out now. They're $1.99. 
I think Amazon's got one for 99 cents. I'm no marketing genius. Even I can get more than 99 cents from people like you. <laughs> Do you know why they're priced that cheap? Because while I'm talking to you this evening in Grand Rapids, someone's downloading one of my e-books at a university in a country even I can't find on a map. Isn't that stunning? And for them, 99 cents is the right price. And you know what? There are more of them than there are of you. So we're learning to market to an audience that's never been there before, wants everything, but needs some help paying for it. By the way, Amazon just opened a Kindle store in India. Kindle is their e-book store. And they came to us publishers, and they said, would you drop the price even more? Your first reaction is, give me a break. We're going to make half a rupee a copy. <laughs> then you wake up in the middle of the night, and you think, wait a minute, they've got a billion people in India which means they got like 150 million college students. I'll take half a rupee a book. Not a bad deal. In other words, we're learning to rethink all of our products and services to reach that customer base. Now, if we're going to bring the world out of poverty, we're going to need an unbelievable amount of fuel, energy. People are going to live decently. We've got to light those houses and apartments up got to cool them. You've got to heat them. They're going to have appliances, washers, dryers, all these things. People have to get to work. Do you realize how many factories are being built around the world to provide the products for people coming out of poverty? Factories use fuel. That means trucks on the road moving products back and forth. The amount of fuel we will have to extract from the Earth in the next 30 years is unlike anything anyone has ever imagined. Whether that means drilling for oil, or natural gas or coal, biofuels, wind, nuclear, solar. My guess is all of the above, plus a couple of things we haven't thought of. But the amount of fuel we will have to extract from Earth is staggering. We're also going to need food, in particular protein. In the last eight years, meat consumption in China more than doubled. It's a lot of cows and pigs. Well, they eat corn, food prices go up. By the way, it turns out people eat bread. Just human beings eat bread. If the price of bread goes up in Grand Rapids, it will make no difference in how much bread you eat. Three years ago, in Cairo, the world price of wheat, which has been going up and up and up, just kicked over the line to where the poor people could not afford their daily loaf of bread. That was the trigger that set off the revolution. The amount of food we're going to need to bring the world out of poverty. Two, three, four, five, six, seven billion people is staggering. And by the way, it takes a lot of fuel to grow food, to plant it, to harvest it, to transport it, to process it, to distribute it, to refrigerate it. Energy and food are gigantic industries to bring the world out of poverty. By the way, there are revolutions in both industries. In energy, fracking, for example. We can now extract fuel from places we couldn't do it before. In food business, genetically engineered seeds. You know, if you're going to bring another four, five, six, seven, eight billion people out of poverty, it's a lot of food to grow. We haven't got enough acreage. Not unless you want to plow up New Jersey. Well, so they're developing genetically engineered seeds to increase yield per acre. Companies like Nestle, the big global food companies are developing new protein bars, things we've never seen before. Not the kind of protein bar you buy at 7-Eleven before you go for a hike or a bike ride, but protein bars out of Star Trek. New food products to feed billions of people very efficiently and inexpensively. It's really exciting stuff. There's a political aspect to this. The environmentalists are against all this. They're against bringing more energy out of the ground. They don't like genetically engineered seeds. And their argument is, well, I want to protect the Earth. That's nice. You just condemned 8 billion people to poverty, which is not an argument they want to have with you. As the world comes out of poverty, we need infrastructure, uh, power stations, water treatment plants, roads, houses, uh, whole new cities, shopping centers, office complexes, malls, hospitals, schools, colleges. Uh, just drive around. All the stuff you see is what it means to be middle class. The amount of construction going on in the world today to create these middle class societies is beyond anything anybody's ever comprehended. By the way, 
Kentucky Fried Chicken and Pizza Hut announced last month their two busiest franchises are in Lagos, Nigeria. Which means people in Lagos are doing what we do, calling up, going there, buying the stuff, running home, reheating it and eating it. Isn't that stunning? It's extraordinary. As people come out of poverty, they buy health care. They buy education. And because we're human beings, they buy entertainment. So the growth industries of the 21st century are energy, food, infrastructure, health care, education, and entertainment. And if you look at those industries through the prism of clever, inexpensive, and green, that's how the customer base grows by 50 to 100 million customers a year. And that's how we create jobs for an entire generation of young Americans. Now, two of the countries that are in the news and lead the way are China and India. Things are changing very fast in both countries now. China's in a lot of trouble. What they've accomplished is extraordinary. Look how many people they brought out of poverty. Look at the size of the Chinese middle class. It's an amazing human achievement. Now they've hit the wall. The Chinese economic model is very simple. We make it happen, we give you cheap labor. Now, either some of you in the audience have done this, or you've read about it. A bunch of guys say, look, we had dinner with these guys in Shanghai three years ago. We signed contracts. Six months later, the factory was open. This country, it takes eight years to file an environmental impact statement. It's true. Do you know how they got the factory open in six months? They shot everyone who objected to it. Ran tanks right over them. Turns out peasants don't like being shot. Who knew? Well, China's middle class. You really can't roll tanks over middle class people. Today, the level of political protest in China is extraordinary. Not just Hong Kong, which we're seeing in the news, but Shanghai, Beijing, all over the place. Uh, they're protesting this power plant, this chemical factory. They don't like this highway project. Last year, the city of Wukong was an open revolt over, I think it was a chemical plant that they wanted to build, and they didn't want it there. To its credit, Government in Beijing just isn't sending tanks and just can't roll tanks over middle class people. So they can't make things happen anymore. The other part of the great Chinese bargain that's attracted so many American companies over there is to give you cheap labor. Well, I'm sure you know China's had a one child per family policy. Birth rate's about 1.1. Did you know China's the most rapidly aging country on earth? Oops. Japan had the very good sense to get rich before it got old. <laughs> China's trying to do it the other way around. Good luck. Last year, for the first time in history, the Chinese workforce shrank. And now it's shrinking at an accelerating rate. Remember, in Spain, Italy, with a 1.2 birth rate, you lose 30% of your entire working age population in 20 years. China's in worse shape. Well, if you studied Economics 101, when the workforce shrinks, wages go up. So Chinese wages are going through the roof. So suddenly they can't make anything happen. And that's why the Chinese are in a panic. And that's why so many American companies are no longer interested in manufacturing in China. They're moving it to Vietnam, Bangladesh, or Burma, or they're bringing it back here to the United States. I live on the West Coast now, as Tom said. From San Diego all the way north to Vancouver, real estate agents are reporting that affluent Chinese are buying property. People like you, they're buying homes. And they're all telling the real estate people the same thing. We think China could blow in five to six years and need a place to run. I think that's overly dramatic. I don't think China's going to blow in five years. But when people like that say things like that and buy property, boy, pay attention. Keep your eye on India. India's coming up fast on the outside. Birth rate's 2.8, by the way. way. It's above the replacement level, almost, with Israel. India is a democracy. They speak English. They got the rule of law. India has made a crucial decision. For 50 years, all India wanted was to lead the third world. Drove everyone crazy. What India says now is, oh, we've outgrown that. Want to sit at the head table. Good. They belong at the head table. I think India is going to blow past China. You know, the Indian middle class is over 300 million, bigger than the US population. And they've just had parliamentary elections in India. Uh, the new prime minister, if this were the United States, we'd say he was the Tea Party candidate. 
He's economically conservative, and he wants to just get the economy going. India has big problems. There's corruption, the power grid's a mess, roads are bad. Democracies are slow to get going, they make mistakes, but you know, they kind of get there. And I think India's gonna blow past China. Don't not notice that. Oh, by the way, American companies uh, do business with everybody. China has a gigantic middle class. They want everything we've got. India has a gigantic middle class. By the way, the difference is this. In the next generation, India's middle class is bigger. China's middle class is smaller. And by the way, there's something you should know about that doesn't get talked about much. We talked about this in Florida. It's sort of icky, so polite people don't like to discuss it, but you need to hear this. And it's back to the demographics. When we have children, you get 103 boys for every 100 girls. That's the human ratio. It's not American versus Oriental. It's not Republican versus Democrat. The human ratio is 103 boys are born to every 100 girls. Today, we have the technology to know which is which. Virtually everywhere in the world, expectant parents can now know the sex of an unborn child. Well, in India and China, there's a cultural preference for boys, so they abort the girls. So many that in these countries, instead of having the normal human ratio of 103 boys to every 100 girls, the ratio in India and China is 118 boys to every 100 girls. Some provinces, it's 130 boys to every 100 girls, and there's a province of China that's reported a ratio of 192 boys to every 100 girls. What this means in real numbers is that today, in these two countries, there are nearly 100 million boys growing up who will never find wives. That's unprecedented. Usually when you have a gender imbalance, you've lost the men in a war. They've lost the women. This has never happened before. Let me tell you, the single most destabilizing force in the world is a bunch of unmarried men. <laughs> there is no example of unmarried women knocking over a 7-Eleven or setting off a car bomb. It doesn't happen. India and China are in panic mode. Both governments have made it a crime for an obstetrician to disclose the sex of an unborn child. It's a jail sentence. They're taking all the sonogram machines out. China says by 2020, the gender gap will be about 200 million. Can you imagine 200 million single guys hitting Shanghai and Beijing on Friday night? <laughs> and by the way, this takes some really odd bounces. You know, human nature is human nature. It doesn't change from country to country. It's human beings. That's why we call it human nature. The caregivers for aging parents aren't the sons and the sons-in-law. The daughters and the daughters-in-law, okay? Everybody knows that. Today, China has 165 million senior citizens. They have no health insurance, no pensions of any kind, and very few daughters because they aborted them. And because they aborted their daughters, their sons can't find wives. So there's a new industry in China. What these companies do is they fly bachelors to other countries for wives. They load up the 747s on Friday night with Chinese bachelors in Shanghai, Beijing, fly them over to Saigon, sorry, Ho Chi Minh City, and they've arranged receptions with the Vietnamese girls, and they cut the deals. I don't mean they cut the deals Friday night, but these companies arrange the transportation, introductions, courtships, marriages, immigration. Chinese men are sweeping across Asia, bringing back gigantic numbers of wives from other countries, and the men in those countries don't like it. These are their daughters, these are their sisters. They've done Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, they just started flying into Burma. It's a disaster. So, you know, you got this aging couple in Shanghai, they got one kid, he's sitting at a Starbucks. And they call him and say, call one of these companies. Come back and get a wife to take care of me. They're just starting to move away from the one child per family policy. We'll see what happens, but just, Human beings and math being what it is, it'll take 30, 40, 50 years for there to be any change. By the way, they just passed a new law in China about two months ago. If you are an only child, which is virtually everyone, by law, you must be in touch with your parents once every 90 days, either by telephone or in person. It's the law. China being China, new industry has developed to outsource this. So if calling mom or having dinner with dad is more than you can handle, you call one of these companies and they will do it for you. 
there's a huge public debate in China now as to whether or not this is OK. <laughs> Believe me, China's not the next superpower. It ain't going to happen. India, by the way, has a, a similar problem. Right now, if you're a 28-year-old programmer with an MBA in New Delhi, life's good. You're busy. You've got a job. You've got some income. Very hard to find a wife because of all the abortions. You can rent a wife. India has a wife rental industry. And the way it works is this. If you have a wife and want some extra income, register. It's like registering your property with a real estate agent. And if you cannot find a wife, but you're willing for a temporary solution, will you rent one? On average, the three-month rental at $175 a month. The average pay being $22 a month, that's real money. India had a woman president until about a year and a half ago. In their system, the prime minister is the head of government, the new guy who got elected. The president's the head of state, and it's an elected position also. And she was the head of state, very capable woman. She said that since they made it a crime for an obstetrician to disclose the sex of an unborn child, more girls, in fact, are being born, which is the whole point. According to the president of India, each day, more than 7,000 newborn girls are being murdered by their own parents. That's her statistic. They've set up a network of refuges all over India. The way it works is this. If you've given birth to a daughter, but you don't want her, don't kill her, drop her off. And the state will raise her in hopes of shifting back these ratios. And this is stuff you just don't see in the newspapers or on CNN. Now, in the last hour, we've made you know, 45 orbits around the planet. And you've been very patient. I wanted to cover a lot of territory. The reason I wanted to come here this evening is to say two more things to those of you here tonight who are students. We're going through a very difficult time right now with the economy, with the war, with things like the Ebola virus. It's easy to be frightened, and it's easy to be a pessimist. Also, pessimism is very fashionable right now among our intellectuals. If you can see a problem nobody else ever thought of, you must be smarter than everybody else. You know, on the day our scientists announce a cure for cancer, there's going to be some talking head on CNN or Fox News who will tell us why this is a disaster. We're going to live longer. It's going to bankrupt Social Security. I mean, give me a break. Don't let the pessimists get you down. We will survive this turmoil. It's frightening. It's unpleasant. We'll make mistakes. We always survive these things. Here's the world that's waiting for you on the other side of this turmoil we're going through. Within your lifetimes, the world will cross a line that's never been crossed before, and most people never even dreamed could be crossed. For the first time in history, the overwhelming majority of human beings will not be poor, and you will live to see it. As the world emerges from poverty, we will see the creation and growth of a global middle class. This global middle class will become the most powerful force in the world. Powerful politically, powerful socially, and above all, powerful economically. Its demand for the products and services American companies can provide is so huge that if we play this right, it will set off what more and more economists believe will not merely be an economic boom, but a sonic boom. <coughs> there is a small but very rapidly growing number of us who believe that we could be at the cutting edge of a supersonic economic boom. And by the way, if you look at the industries that will dominate the 21st century, energy, food, infrastructure, health care, education, entertainment, what country holds the world's leadership in all six industries? It's the United States. And this gets me to the point I wanted to make. My generation won the Cold War. My parents' generation won World War II. They took out the fascists. We took out the communists. The great question for your generation is, what are you going to do? 
other than goof around on your Facebook page and hang around Starbucks. <laughs> and for the first time, now we can see a job for you people who are students tonight. going to have to figure out how to bring the world out of poverty without trashing the planet. Wow. I cannot imagine a more interesting, more important, more optimistic, or a more exciting job for a generation. Lucky you. <laughs> and thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Do you want to organize it? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for two or three questions. Yes, you answered them. Anything? Area 51? Anything? Yeah. That's a very good question. You know, we're a little bit different than the British, who are different than the French, who are different than the Germans, who are different than the Poles, who are different than the Australians. But the similarities are more striking than the differences. And when you look at modernity, what it sort of means is you grow up, you settle down, you have a couple of kids, you have a place to live when you get married, then you maybe get a bigger house or you buy a house. Uh, you want to go shopping on the weekends. You want to travel a little bit. That's sort of the modern world. Now, the French do it differently than we do, and the Poles do it differently than the French. But the similarities are more striking than the differences. Sure, they'll do it differently in India or China than we do it here. But still, that's modernity. That's the modern world. And you know, there's one thing that everyone agrees on in the world, whether we're American or Asian or European or Christian or Jewish or Muslim, it's leave me alone. <laughs> Nobody wants to be told what to do. We all want to live our lives according to the tenets of our faith, of our consciences. And when you let people alone and they become modern, it's OK. We get along. You and I can disagree about everything, and then we'll go out and have a cup of coffee. So that's the modern world. So yeah, there is a certain sameness to it. And I guess there'll be some philosophers who will sort of have a problem with that. But I think it's a much better, safer world that we disagree with everything. But I mean, I wouldn't dream of you know, shooting you, or you wouldn't dream of you know, yelling at me. We just don't do that kind of thing. And I think that's the world you're heading for. So don't, don't be bothered by the differences. And celebrate the differences. But the similarities under those are more striking. And that's what catches my attention. Yes, sir. Yeah, the question, if you didn't hear, is there any similarity between the, the way we do things in the English-speaking world and the rest of the world? And the answer is yes. And the reason is we got there first. In other words, we, in effect, defined modernity. So it's not that they're sort of emulating the English or the Americans. This is what it means to be modern. And what's fascinating is you just let people alone. And they just want to live, and they want to improve their lives, and they want to have a nice place to live, and they want to be busy with their jobs and their kids, and they want to get together with friends on a Saturday night. That's what people do. So does it look like what we did? Yeah, only because we got there first. And that's why. Last question. We started out talking about the excitement of the Islamic world coming into the modern time. Mm -hmm.
But that's okay. Let them become modern. Let's help them in every way we can. And I say, this is one of the greatest moments in world history. The world's becoming modern. Now, is it complicated? Yes. Is it sloppy? Boy, is it sloppy. Does it often look like we're going backwards rather than forwards? Yeah, but that's what it looks like. Look what we went through in the 18th, 19th centuries and the 20th century. What a mess we made. But we got there. By the way, um, when Jill and I became parents, I had a fantasy that our kids would go from 12 to 30 flawlessly. <laughs> Hasn't happened. And by the way, I didn't go from 12 to 30 flawlessly. And yet somehow we expect the, the world to go from you know, 7th century to 21st century overnight without missing a beat. Can't happen. And by the way, with people like Doug Kinsey, wherever he is here tonight, you know, they're doing an unbelievable job helping this along, teaching us, teaching them. Wow, it's actually happening. So we can either be discouraged by all the problems and all of this, just like parents are discouraged when the kid makes this mistake, does that wrong, flunks that course, and so forth. Or you can say, you know, it's going OK. We'll get there. And I think we're going to get there. And but there's one thing we learned from President Reagan, be an optimist. Be a pessimist. First of all, it's tough getting up in the morning. Second, it depresses everybody else. And I just think this pessimism's gone too far. And the world is a much more exciting place for our young people than, than we realize. Thank anyway, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to go. I'd like to give Mr. Meyer something from a man who is the biggest optimist I know. That's Ralph Hallenstein. So you get a Ralph Hallenstein swag bag. Whoa. <laughs> Look at that. Thank you. Come back. Her. I would love to. Thank you very much. We're adjourned. Thank you so much. <laughs>